Okay, well, last time we had this uh, inclement weather cancellation of classes, and so I put the uh, last lecture up on iTunes U, and I hope you've had a chance to access that, because in order to stay on track, we really have to keep moving. Um, there are a lot of details for us to cover. So just very briefly, skimming over what we did last time, we're starting in Chapter 4. The topic is computer architecture, and we are at ISA 3. And everything at ISA 3 level, instruction set architecture level, is what? Is what type? There's only one type, binary. Okay? So we introduced the concept of the virtual machine, the PEP9 virtual machine that we're going to be studying to use, the, um, to use in our studies. And the figure 4.1, we took a look at the central processing unit and the main memory. And what is that called, where the input and output are wired into main memory? That's called what? Memory map to I.O. And we saw that these, this is the content of the central processing unit, the CPU. So it has the four status bits, a 16-bit accumulator, a 16-bit index register, a 16-bit program counter, and a 16-bit stack pointer. That points to the top of the runtime stack. And the instruction register that stores the register that the register that stores the instruction that is to be executed. Then we took a look at main memory, and we said that. In main memory, it's always stored, information is always stored in chunks of how many bits? Eight. So every byte in main memory has an address. Remember that? And how many bytes are there in the PEP9 main memory? 64. 64 kilobytes. Okay? And each one of them has an individual address that's written in hex. And it starts at 0000 and goes all the way up to FFFF. And then we said that this figure 4.4 is another way to look at main memory. Oh, and by the way, in figure 4.3, we note that for human consumption, what happens is, like in a program listing or on a display, there could be more than one byte on a line. Okay, and so we took a look at, in figure 4.4, how even though it looks like in figure 4.4 there might not be, there's the same number of bytes on the line, but that is in fact not the case. And then we took a look at figure 4.5 and we saw the distinction between the content in memory as written in binary, the content as written in hexadecimal, and then the content as it would look in a machine language listing. And this is the format that we're going to see it uh, today. We're going to take a look at a machine language listing. And then we reviewed, we looked at figure 4.6, which is the instruction set. Now here's the thing, you guys. Every central processing unit has wired into it, in the hardware, a set of instructions. Okay? And these instructions in the PEP9 instruction set are typical of instructions that are in all hardware CPUs. Okay? And we, look at, and, and we looked at how the instruction specifier are the bits that tell what instruction is going to be executed. And we saw how to decode them by looking up in this ta uh, figure 4.6 table. And we said that there are two different kinds of instructions. There are non-unary instructions that have how many bytes? Here in figure 4.7, how many bytes in a non-unary instruction? Correct, three. Okay, so in a non-unary instruction has one byte for the instruction specifier and two bytes for the operand specifier. Okay, and then the other kind of instruction is a unary instruction that has how many bytes? One. one. Are you with me? Is everybody clear? So there's two flavors of instructions. Three byte instructions and one byte instructions. And then we looked at the table in figure 4.8 that says, that shows us how to decode the addressing mode. So we looked at the addressing AAA bits, and you just go to this figure 4.8, and you can look up in the table what the addressing mode is. Now today, we are going to learn direct addressing. So in figure 4.8, what is the addressing AAA field for direct addressing? 001. So all of the examples that we're going to look at today are going to be, have that 001 for the addressing AAA field. Okay? Any, so, everybody, so we're going to go through a list of instructions here in a minute. Okay? And then we said there was the addressing A field, so if there is only a, 
an addressing sum instruction is just have an addressing A field, just one bit. So for the addressing A field, if the bit is zero, that specifies immediate addressing, and if the bit is one, that specifies indexed addressing. And then we're going to take a look today in our examples at the register R field in some instructions, and so if R is zero, that indicates the accumulator, and if R is one, that indicates the index register. Okay? And all of these tables will be available uh, to you on an exam. I have a reference packet that you'll have, and these tables are all included in the reference packet. And then uh, in figure 4.9, we took a look at some examples of, of if you have a bit pattern in main memory, how do you identify what the instruction is, what, where the register R field is, where the register AA field is, and we did some examples here in, in figure 4.9. Okay? Now, are there any questions about in, any of this before we go on? Because now we're going now, now we're gonna, to we're gonna move fairly rapidly now, so. Yeah, question? The 0, 1, 8, that's just, I just picked a random example. The 0, 1, 8, 3 is, represents the address of that byte. Notice that the address of the next byte is 0, 1, A, 4, and the address of the next byte is 0, 1, A, 5, and the next byte is 0, 1, A, 6. I just picked, pulled that out of yeah, there's no significance to that. Yeah, just to show that that is a place in memory where an instruction could be stored. Yeah. But no significance to that otherwise. Yeah. Where is that? That is a really good question. The question is, where is the address of each byte stored? The, a we, the address is built into the main memory. And so it's there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what happens is you use the address, instruction, different instructions use addresses to refer to that point in memory. That was actually a good question. All of these, that's the kind of question that you, will become abundantly clear as we go on. Right now we just have to understand the architecture, you know, the, the way these things are all put together. You see what I mean? So we just have to, and you just got to memorize all these details. That's all there is to it. Okay, so now let's, now, so all of our examples today are going to use direct addressing. Now in this slide we have a definition of direct addressing. All right, so now in direct addressing the operand specifier is the address in memory of where the operand is. Do you see what we're saying? The operand specifier is the memory address of the operand. So what is, now what is the operand specifier again? Do you see where the operand specifier is? It's the second and the third byte. It's the two bytes that come after the instruction specifier. So what we're saying then is that that location, that part of the instruction is the address of where the operand is. So this will become more clear actually when we do a few specific examples. But this is one of eight addressing modes, and we will learn all the other ones as we go on in the course, but this is the first one that we will learn, direct addressing. <clears throat> so here we go. Now we're going to take a tour through a lot of these, through several of these instructions and see how each one individually operates. So the first one is the stop instruction. And the instruction specifier is 0000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, and that causes the computer to stop. Now, of all the instructions in the instruction set of the PEP9 virtual computer, this is probably the least realistic one because there is really not a stop instruction in most CPUs. Because, the, because after all, what happens is when you stop an application, well, the operating, it doesn't, the computer doesn't shut down. It goes on and, you know, continues on to give you the graphical user interface and so on. All right? So this one is, this one is the least realistic one. But for, uh, for our purposes, for our PEP9 virtual machine, if you execute this, the virtual machine will stop the execution and return you to the, to the virtual machine app. All right? So that's, the per that's what this instruction does. All right? Now, now, this next group of instructions, here is an important concept. These next few instructions are called load and store. And here is the main meaning of load and store. Load. 
Both load and store transfer information from one part of the computer to another. Load is from main memory to the CPU. From main memory to the CPU. This is super critical. This is, this is, and this, by the way, is on all machines. All real hardware machines use these, use load and store instructions. And it's always load and it's always store, and yeah. So here's load and here's store. And so what do you suppose? If load is from main memory to the CPU, store is probably what? From the CPU to main memory. All right, so remember this, load from main memory to CPU, store from CPU to main memory, all right? Now here is our next instruction, the load word instruction. This is the load word instruction. A word in PEP9 is two bytes, okay? And if you, look, if you look back up in that table, you'll see that the instruction specifier is 1100 and then RAAA. So R is the what? The lowercase r and the RAAA. That's the instruction R field. And the AAA is the addressing AAA field. So those are bits. Those are, each one of those is a binary value. And what this does is this, this loads one word from memory to register R. Now, what register do you suppose it's going to put it into? Well, it depends on the R bit. And do you remember, let's go back to the R. Here in figure 4.8C, do you see that R? Zero is accumulator, one is index register. Are you with me? So what this does, this load word instruction does, is it loads two bytes from memory to register R. So here is the, what is this language called down here in the bottom? This R gets operand, semicolon, blah, blah, blah. What is that? What? That's the register transfer language, RTL. And what does this, in the process of moving this, after it moves it, what does it set? What state of space does it set? The N bit and the Z bit, yeah. Okay, you see that. So if, if what got loaded from memory into the, into the register was all zeros, then, then the Z bit would be set to, um, it was all zeros, the Z bit would be set to one. Okay? All right, now in figure 4.10 and 4.11 is a specific example of exactly how this instruction works. So let's, uh, so in this first part of the figure, we have the instruction written out all in binary. And we've indicated here on the figure which part is the opcode, which part is the register R field, and which part is the register AAA field. Is everybody clear on that? So the opcode is 1100, the R field is zero, and the AAA field is what? 001, which indicates what kind of addressing? Direct addressing. Are you with me? Okay, and what is the operand specifier in hex? 004A, okay? So let's suppose that this instruction gets executed. What will happen? So we have a before and an after. So here in part A of this figure is the before. Now let's inspect this figure, this state of the machine before the execution of the instruction. I've shown here a little uh, uh, scaled down abbreviated version of a few of the registers in the CPU and just uh, two bytes in memory, okay, just space wise. I, okay, we're just, is everybody clear? So what does it look like we have? At memory address 004A, what is the content? At memory address 004A. 92EF. Now tell me, what is the address of the 92? Well, it's right there. We just said it. What's the address of the 92? Uh, What's the address of the EF? Uh, 
Is the address of the byte at of the byte EF is that is this address also 004A? Yes or no? Yes or no? Come on. Yes. Yes. No. <laughs> it's a, every byte has an individual address. That's the next byte. Are you is everybody clear on this? The byte at EF is at address what? 004B. Now, this is important. Does everybody see this? Every byte has an individual address, and we're showing two bytes, and the address that we conventionally show is the address of the first byte of the pair. Is everybody clear on this? Are you with me? So the 92 is at address 004A, the EF is at 004B. Now, what is inside the accumulator? What is the content of the accumulator? 036D. All right, so this is before, all right? Now, what does this statement, if this statement executes, what does it do? Well, it takes a look, and what is the, what is the register R field of the instruction? The bit, what, that's a zero. That indicates what register? Zero for the accumulator. So this is going to load the information from memory to what, to where? to the accumulator. Now where is it going to get the information to put into the accumulator? It's going to look at the operand specifier. And what is the operand specifier in hex? 004A. So that's the address in memory of where it goes to get the information to put it into the accumulator. Now is everybody clear on this? So can you predict what is going to be the state of the computer after we execute this instruction? Come on. What's it going to look like? Come on. Ah. Time's a wasting. Well, what do you? Well, yeah. What's going to happen is the accumulator, the contents of the accumulator, is going to get wiped out and replaced with what? The contents of memory, the contents of memory at location 004. 004A. So does everybody see? Then boom. Here's what that instruction does. So the accumulator has been changed, the content of the accumulator has been changed to 92EF, and notice that it took a copy from main memory. Main memory still has 92EF in it. And furthermore, the end bit was set to 1, and the Z bit was set to 0. Now why was the end bit set to 1? Because, end, because, because that quantity, 92EF, if you write it in binary, 9 to E, F, if you write, what is 9 in binary? What are the four bits for 9? Come on. 1, one. no, 1, zero, zero, 1, and then the 2 is what? 0, zero 1, zero, right? The E is what? Come on. 1, 1, 1, 0. And the F is what? 1, 1, 1, 1. So this is what gets sent to the accumulator. And furthermore, there's a what? A 1 in the sign bit, which would be, it would, would be negative if it's interpreted as a 2's complement number. Does everybody, now, does everybody see what this instruction does? Are we good? This is wired into the hardware. With, you know, this is hardware. Okay. Yeah, question? So does n get 1 because the sign bit is 1 or because r is less than 0 or because of both? Both. Okay. Now, does everybody, does everybody see how this worked? Okay. Now, let's do another one. Let's do store word instruction. So the instruction specifier is 1100. And then we have the register R field, the addressing AAA field. And that stores two bytes from register R to memory. In this case, the status bits are not affected. So here is, in figure 4.12 and 4.13, here is an example instruction. So do you see then that the instruction, if you wrote, write out the instruction in hex, the instruction itself would be E9004A. And in this case, the R bit is what? The register R field is what? One. What does that indicate? Which register does that indicate? 
that indicates the index register. So what do you suppose this statement will do when it executes? Yeah, and from where? This time it's coming from where? The CPU, but which register in the CPU? The X register, the index register. Is everybody clear? And that's because the R bit is one. So any predictions? Oh, and here again, 004A is the operand specifier, and for direct addressing, that is the address in memory of where the operand, of the operand. So when we do store, if we store the index register, then, and this is before, what's going to be the after? In the memory, the value of is 16BC. That is ex exactly correct. Now I ask you again, what is the address of the, of the byte 16? And what, correct, it's 004A. And what is the address of the byte BC? 004B. So you tell it the first byte of, of, of the two bytes of, of, where, of where it goes. The instruction tells it of the first byte. But it actually puts it at 004A and 004B because it's putting two bytes in. Is everybody clear? Is it, are we good? Okay. Now, the add instruction is how, now we're, we'll do some computation. So the add instruction, the instruction specifier is 0, 0, 0110, RAAA. It adds one word. And so what, into register R, and now look at what this, ad, look, look at what does the RTL say that this instruction does. It takes whatever is in register R, adds the what? Operand, Operand to it, and puts the result where? Back into register R. Are you with me? And we've already seen, how, we've already learned how the N, Z, V, and C bits are set when you do an addition. Is everybody, yeah? Okay. All right, so here we go. Here's an example of the instruction, 69004A. So you understand that instruction is written all in binary. We abbreviate it 69004A. Okay, what would happen if this instruction executes provided that we have the state as in figure A in figure 4.15. So now, what is it telling us to do? What is, register R, what is the register R field? One, which indicates which register? The index register. So it's going to add something. And what is the addressing AAA field? 00 and direct. So that means that the 004A is the address in memory of what we're going to do, of what we're going to add. So do you see the content of main memory is FFF9? I ask you again, what's the address of the FF in memory? What is the address of the F9? Yes, 004B. Okay. And so now, can you tell what's going to be happening if we add that? What's in the index register is 5. What's, what's, in, the, uh, what's in main memory? FFF9. What number is that? Here, let's do F, 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 9. So what, number, what is this in binary? 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Now what was 9? 1, 0, 0, 1. Do you, know, do you know what negative number this is? Can we figure that out real quick? How do we do that? What is, it's 2. We look at the places of the zeros, right? So it's 2 plus 4 is what? 6 and then... And one more is seven, so that's a negative seven. So what are we adding? Five, Five and negative seven. What should we get? Negative two. negative two. And how do you write negative two? Yeah, one 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 zero. So that's F F F E. Now does everybody see how that instruction worked? Are we good? Okay. The subtract instruction, it's the, does the same thing, only this time it subtracts, okay? So the, here's the instruction specifier, it subtracts two bytes from memory, two bytes from memory from register R, okay? So it has a register R field and an addressing AAA field. Here's an example, 
So the instruction in, written in hex is 71004A. And let's suppose that we have this initially. Now, um, what is the register R field in this case, in binary? Yeah, the, the, in binary, the register R field is zero, which indicates the accumulator. So this is going to subtract from the accumulator and put the results in the, in the accumulator. So now, what are we doing? We're taking three minus what? Yeah, zero, zero, nine. Three minus nine, right? We're subtracting nine. So what should we get? Negative six. Are we taking three minus nine or nine minus three? I think we're taking three minus nine, aren't we? What, here, let's go back. It's R, it's the register minus the operand. So what is this doing? Taking three, what's three minus nine? Negative six, so, okay? So negative six is FFFA. Is everybody, is everybody clear on subtract, okay? Now, a few uh, logic instructions. We have an AND instruction. The instruction specifier is 1000, and it takes the AND of one word, in other words, two bytes from memory to register R. So you see it's R gets R and the operand. And here's the example of this instruction. The re now what is the register R field? One, so that indicates which register? The index register. So now in figure, part A of the figure, now what do we have at memory location 004A? 00FF, so what is that in binary? That's this, right? Now what do we have in the index register? 5DC3. What's 5? That's 5, right? What's D? Somebody tell me. It's 1 something. Come on, quick, quick, quick. Time's wasted. Come on, somebody tell me D. 1101? Uh, what's the next one? Is that C? And then what is 3? Right? And what are we doing? Which instruction is this? AND? So what does AND do? If these are all 1, what does 1 AND anything? One and anything is one? No, one or anything is one, isn't it? I think one and is, is anything. Is, yeah, it's the identity, right? Is everybody, yeah, we need to know this. <laughs> this is pretty, pretty crucial. So, so these come down unchanged, right? One, one, zero, 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 one, one. Now what is zero and anything? Now's your chance. What is zero, what is false and anything? Yeah, zero. So this is zero, 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 zero. So any predictions on what this is going to come up here? In hex? Yeah, yeah, yes. Zero, zero, C3. Now, is everybody clear on this? Are we good? Okay. Here's the same thing, but with or. So the only, so here we have R gets R or the operand. And so now it's the same example, 00FF and 5DC3, but this time, if, this, if we change this to an or, what happens? Now, if, we, if this is changed to an or, what happens? Anywhere there's a one, there's one. Anywhere there's one, there's one. So, these, so this second half would be, would be what? Yeah, these would be all one, so this would be FF. And this would be what? This would come down, right? So does everybody see? So, so that's why it's 5DFF. Now is everybody clear on that? All this logic that we've done before now all comes into play, all of our formal methods. Zero, uh, zero is the zero of and, zero is the identity of or, right? And then one is the what? identity of AND, and one is the zero of OR. Anyway, so invert, 
So we have an we have an invert instruction. Now invert is a is a unary because what it does is it doesn't when you flip all the bits of an of a quantity there's only one quantity involved. So this is an example of a unary instruction. So it's only one byte. There is no operand specifier. So there's only an instruction. There's only a register R field. So this will invert, what will this invert? It will invert which register? Either what or what in the CPU? The register R field? The index, the index register or the accumulator. So here do you see then the, how this instruction works? If beforehand the accumulator is 0003 in hex and you flip all the bits, then after the instruction it's FFFC. Is everybody good? Yeah. When you say you flip all the bits, what does that mean? You change the, each one to zero and each zero to one. Oh. It's not, it's the not operation from formal methods. Oh, okay. Are you, are you with me? So not true is false, not false is true. Are we good? Is everybody clear? Okay. And the negate instruction takes the two's complement. So it negates it. And again, this is a unary instruction. Okay? So if the original, uh, if we negate the accumulator, if the original content is 0003 and we ne negate it, we, we get negative 3, and that's how negative 3 is stored, FFFD. Okay? Is everybody good? All right? Now, we also have those instructions when they operated on an, on an operand, the operand was two bytes. But now we also have instructions that only operate on one byte. So the, the, this next instruction is called load byte instruction. So now let's take a look at how this load byte instruction works. It loads one byte from memory to where? To the right half of register R because each register in memory is how many bytes how many bytes is the accumulator? Two bytes. 16 bits, which is two bytes. And so because we're loading, because we're taking just one byte from memory, the question is, where does it put it? In that register. And the answer is, it's wired in to put it in the right half. The least significant byte. Now, is everybody, are we good? All these details are all... You have to understand how each little detail works. Each little detail is easy, but there's just so many of them. Okay. So, and now do you see in the register transfer language, do you see what R angle bracket 8 dot dot 15 means? That angle bracket was the bit index. So the bits are numbered like they are in C in an array. So starting from 0 on the left. So do you see that R8.15 is the right half of the register? Does everybody see how to read that register transfer language? Yeah. But are we, is, is everybody, does everybody see? So what this does is this, and, and so what happens is the other bytes remain, un, the, the left byte remains unchanged. Okay, so here's an example of the load byte instruction. And now what is the register R field? Zero, which indicates what uh, register in the accumulator? Ah, in the CPU, the accumulator. <laughs> All right, so here we have before. Here's our before picture. All right, now look. Now, you guys, I'm not showing in main memory in part A. We are not showing the byte that is next to the 92, which would be at address what? 004B. Notice that memory does not have a left half and a right half of a compartment. Each compartment in memory is one byte. Memory is byte addressable. I cannot emphasize how confusing this is when you're first learning this stuff. We have to always keep this mental model in our mind. Every byte in memory has its own address. Sometimes we don't show the address of each byte in a listing. We just show the address of the first byte, but each memory location, 
which is one byte has its own address. Memory is byte addressable. So look, if this is what happens before the load byte accumulator instruction, what you, can you predict what it's going to look like after? What? Uh, <laughs> yes. The value of the accumulator A. Yeah, in the accumulator is What will it be? 0392. Yes. It will be 0392. Does everybody see how that worked? Are we good? And then we also have a store byte. Okay, so here we go. 1111 is the op code, register R field, addressing AAA field, stores one byte. Now, and now here, what does it do? Stores one byte from where to where? Right. From the right half of register to memory. And remember, memory is byte addressable, so it's not like the second one over, because memory is byte addressable. Question? Do we have to memorize the instruction specifiers? Obviously, you do not have to memorize the instruction specifiers. That's all going to be given. That whole table is all going to be given. All these tables are all going to be given. Yeah. So here's an example. So does everybody see if this before and after in figure 4.26? If A, A accumulator has 036D and memory at 004A has 92, then after the store, remember store is from the CPU to main memory. So after the store, the main memory at 004A has value 6D. Is everybody clear? All right, now you guys comes how we do input and output. Now watch this. Remember, PEP9 computer is, has memory mapped input output. So what happens is the keyboard is wired into memory. And when you type letters on a keyboard, what happens is there's a buffer inside the keyboard that collects that stream of characters. And that keyboard is wired into main memory. And every time you execute a load from main memory, it triggers the hardware to take the character that's in the front of the buffer, all right, and that, that character is wired into memory and when you load it from memory into the, and, and so the way you get it, the way you process it is to load it from that address in memory into the CPU. So it's the same load byte instruction. And just instead of getting it from some arbitrary location, you get it from main memory. And this figure in figure 4.27 shows what? What is the address where the keyboard is wired into? FC15. That is the address for the keyboard. So how do you get something from the keyboard or from the input stream? You load it from where? FC15 using direct addressing. Is everybody clear? So before you load the byte from FC15, it looks like this. After you load the byte, the accumulator has 5.7 in the rightmost half, as shown in part B here. Is, does everybody see how that works? Yeah, question? Because it's lower, it's only the one byte. Yeah, notice that, remember that an ASCII character, these are ASCII characters, by the way. So an ASCII character is one byte. You see, so that and so it just uses the right half of the accumulator. Yeah. Is the W highlighted to represent like? Oh, that QWE. That's like the Q. That's the QWERTY keyboard. QWE on the keyboard. So it, as if you press the W. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What happens is when you when you press the W, then that that character goes into the into the stream into the input stream from the keyboard, which is fed into that byte location in memory. Yeah. So this is a picture. Does everybody see how this picture works? So the way you get input is you just, it's the load byte instruction, but you just do, do it from FC15. Now, that's the input. What about the output? According to figure 4.28, where is the output, the screen stored? Where is the monitor stored for the output stream of characters? At what, at what memory location? FC16. So notice that, so notice that um, in the accumulator, is, the right half of the accumulator is 69. Now do you have the ASCII chart? By the way, the ASCII chart is in the inside back cover of the book. So what is the, what is the hex 69? What character is that? I. I. 
So that's lowercase i. So if we store byte accumulator into memory location FC16, that will cause the 6.9 to go to the memory FC16, but because that's wired into the screen, that goes into the output stream. So now that's the letter I. Is everybody, is everybody good on how that works? Okay, now comes the next big deal. Wired in to the every CPU in the hardware is a cycle called the von Neumann execution cycle. And this is an amazing design because von Neumann came up with this like a half a century ago. I mean, when computers were first being invented, this idea came, you know, was presented on how to build commercial machines. This design has remained unchanged for ever since electronic computers were first invented. It's really an amazing, you know, people, you, we think about, oh, how technology changes, blah, blah, blah. The only thing that changes is that, it, you know, the, you, you get more memory and it's faster. The von Neumann cycle has been with us since the beginning, since the stone age of computers, right? And here is the von Neumann cycle. So every computer chip works this way. Every commercial compu computer chip works this way. Every chip has a von Neumann cycle. And this you have to memorize. All right, I might ask you, what, is, what are the steps of the von Neumann cycle? And here they are. Let me just reel them off. Fetch, decode, increment, execute, repeat. If you remember nothing from this course, remember fetch, decode, increment, execute, and repeat. And you know how we talked about your gigahertz cycle of your CPU? And so many like billion cycles per second. Each one of those cycles is a fetch, decode, increment, execute, repeat. That is a cycle. That is the cycle. That is your, this is your gigahertz cycle. Is everybody clear? Because look, computers can't think. Is all they can do is fetch, decode, increment, execute, repeat. That's all they're doing. At the heart, this is the heartbeat of all computation on commercial computers. All right? So what, is, what does each one of these mean? You fetch the instruction, and what did we say the PC stands for? Program counter. And what does that program counter contain? The address of the instruction to execute next. So you see in this notation, mem sub PC, it's as if memory is an array, and the, and the address is like the index of the array. Do you see what we're saying? You, that's a good way to think of it. You, could, you should think of main memory as just an array. And you should think of each address as just being the index of the array. Yeah? And, each, and it is an array of what? Of integers? No. It's an array of what? But, no. The memory is an array of what? Bytes. Are you with me? So when you address memory, you're accessing a byte of memory. So you fetch the instruction, and the program counter tells you where to go to fetch the instruction. Then what happens is that instruction is brought into the CPU, stored in the instruction register, and then the circuitry, you know how you look up in the table what the instruction is, and you look at the opcode? Remember how you did that exercise? The electronic circuitry does that. It has built into it the table. And it, and it decodes it. It says, oh, that's this instruction, blah, 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 blah. And it looks at the register R field, the addressing AA. Oh, this is direct addressing. The, the electronics does that. That's the decode step. Then, then, now here, then it does not execute the instruction then because what happens is it lo what happens is it increments the program counter. Okay? And when it why does it increment the program counter? Because, because the next instruction to be executed has to do, be the one after this one. So it adds to the program counter so that it will point to the next instruction. And after it increments it, then it executes the instruction that is in the instruction register that it had decoded before. Is everybody clear? And then it goes and does the same thing. It goes back to the top. Boom, boom, boom. Billions of times per second. Yeah. Is there a reason why like increment comes before? Oh, that is such a good question. 
Is there a reason why increment comes before execute? And the answer is yes, and we will see why when we talk about branching instructions. Yeah, that is a really good, inst in fact, that brings up a, an important detail. It is a detail, but it is important. The fact that you increment the program counter before you execute the instruction that you fetched. That was a good observation. Is everybody, are we good? Now, in figure 4.31, this is a kind of like a software description of what is going on in the hardware. This is the logic of what's going on in the hardware. So, the von Neumann, now do you see that the von Neumann cycle is the do and while? Do you see? Because while, the, when you say while, you know, while, while the stop instructions is not execute, you go back, and, that's the repeat. You go back up to the do. Does everybody see how this works? Okay. So what happens before we start the cycle? Before we start the cycle, the very first time, what do we, there's two things that we do. What does it say there? The very first thing is what? We have to load, see, yeah, the question is, where is this program? You got to have the program, the instructions of the program, be in main memory before you can execute them. So there is a process that, by which that program gets loaded into main memory. That is the job of the operating system to do that. Are you with me? So the program, those bits for all those instructions are loaded into memory. And then you have to initialize the program counter and the stack pointer to the appropriate values. And then you start the von Neumann cycle running. And then once you hit stop, then boom, the, virtu the PEP9 virtual machine stops and you're ready to go, you're, you're go, you go back to the app and you write another program. Does everybody see how that works? Now this next slide is even a little bit more detail because now think about it. When we fetch an instruction, how many bytes should we fetch? There's two possibilities. How many bytes should we fetch? Either one, if it's what kind of an instruction? A unary instruction, but we possibly need to fetch what? Well, all together, three, we, yeah. In, 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 in any case, we always fetch one. We might fetch two additional, more, two additional bytes. How do we know ahead of time whether to fetch the two additional bytes? Well, it depends on whether the instruction is unary or non-unary. But how is a CPU going to know whether the instruction is unary or non-unary? By looking at the bits in the first byte in the instruction specifier. So it does that before it fetches? It always fetches the instruction specifier. Mm -hmm. Then it looks at the bits in the instruction specifier. And if it is a non-unary instruction, then it knows that it has to do what? Fetch two more. Now, do you, so do you see how this logic works in, on this code? So that is literally how, how, how the hardware has to do it. So we, we, we will remember, fetch, decode, increment, execute, repeat, and we'll increment either by one or by three, but inside it does it in steps in these stages. Okay? And now, you guys, that it's time to quit, shoot. We have our first machine language program in figure 4.33. So what we're going to do is on Thursday, now you have to write a machine language program in your assignment for Thursday. So you read this material through. I'll give you a demo on how to do it on Thursday, but there's tutorials online and there's, uh, have, you, have you seen the website for the computersystemsbook.com? There's a website for the book and that website has the, um, the PEP9 virtual machine simulator. So you'll download that and install it and we're going to be programming in, a, in we're going to be programming on that virtual machine with that app. Okay? Good deal. See you on Thursday.